Hey, hey, welcome to Screen Crush. I'm Ryan Airy, and let's talk about the Guardians of the Galaxy. Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 3 wrapped up things pretty perfectly for all of our favorite Guardians characters. It really felt like a true swan song for the whole team, but then there was the final post credit scene that made some of us scratch our heads, and more specifically, the final text that followed, which read, the legendary Star-Lord will return. So we're gonna talk about how this ties specifically into the X-Men, Avengers Secret Wars, and could even show the return of Thanos. Thanos? No. I'm here to kill Thanos. And of course, along the way as we're talking, feel free to let me know your thoughts on all of this down in the comments below. So at the end of Guardians 3, we see Star-Lord return to Earth to reconnect with his grandfather. And then in the post credit scene, we see that Star-Lord is now living with his grandfather and discussing mundane things like mowing the lawn. And then in typical MCU fashion, we get a title card that promises a return. In Guardians 1 and 2, we got text that read the Guardians of the Galaxy will return. In the Avengers, we got text that read the Avengers will return. Civil War said Spider-Man will return. I could go on. But Guardians 3 promises promised only the return of one Guardian, Peter Quill's Star-Lord. Now, a little later, we'll talk about the other Guardians and if and when we'll see them again. But first, let's talk about the legendary Star-Lord and where he'll pop up next. Now, at first, this seems like just a gag, like Star-Lord's doing mundane things like eating Magic Spoon cereal, but we're still calling him legendary. But the title, The Legendary Star-Lord, is the title of a comic line that served as a prelude to the 2015 Secret Wars comics. So in this comic, readers saw Star-Lord break from the Guardians team and go out on his own which is exactly what we got in Guardians 3, Star-Lord leaving the team to return to Earth. Now, in the comic book, Star-Lord went toe-to-toe -to -toe with his comic book father, Jason, the king of a planet called Spartax. But in the MCU, Star-Lord is the son of a celestial ego, the living planet. But there is a fun wink and a nod to his comic father, Jason, with his grandfather being named Jason. Now, we've already seen this whole storyline somewhat adapted in Guardians 2 when Star-Lord battled Ego, but we don't really know much about his Earth family. So we could still see the legendary Star-Lord project focus on Peter Quill's family history on Earth, like how the comics focused on his galactic lineage. And this could give us some insights as to why Ego chose Peter's mother specifically to give rise to an heir. For instance, there is that fan theory that since Meredith Quill and this random lady at the USO show are played by the same actress, then maybe this is who Steve Rogers lost his virginity to. Captain America! Language. And that Star-Lord already had super soldier serum in his blood from his grandmother. Okay, wait, wait, wait. Is this Star-Lord thing going to be a movie or a TV show or what? Well, that's a great question, buddy. Marvel Studios has released their full Phase 5 lineup and some of Phase 6. Now, Phase 6 has 11 spots, eight of which are currently unaccounted for. Phase 6 starts off with the Fantastic Four. And then we have six more projects before Avengers the Kang Dynasty. And then after that, we have two projects between Kang Dynasty and Secret Wars. And that'll be the final film of the multiverse saga. Granted, Marvel is scaling back. Some of these things could change, but I think that it is very likely that we'll be getting either a movie, a series, or a special presentation titled The Legendary Star-Lord, and I think this is going to be announced soon as part of the MCU's Phase 6, and my money is on it being a movie. Chris Pratt is a movie star, and yeah, he got his start on television with Parks and Rec, and he's done special presentations like the Guardians Holiday Special, but he's a really big name in Hollywood, and I think that we're going to see him headline his own feature film, a film where he is the title character Star-Lord. Star-Lord, man. And this could cement him as a mainstay character for the MCU. With big characters like Tony Stark, Steve Rogers, and Black Widow no longer being around, Star-Lord can provide some familiarity as an OG MCU character. I mean, keep in mind that he's been around since phase two of the MCU. Well, I never thought of it that way. Yeah, I know, right? Person, what's on your face? This is my eye cream, my guy. Why, you don't seem like the kind of guy who uses skincare. Oh, dude, you have to use skincare. I mean, have you seen that picture of the trucker who didn't use sunscreen on half his face? I mean, I want to take care of myself. All this is not an accident. Well, you do look nice. What's that? This why, Doug, this is my AM moisturizer with SPF 20. It's actually part of the level one system from Tiege Hanley. They're the sponsor of this video. Now, I like Tiege Hanley because they make a skincare routine that's easy to understand and uncomplicated. See, level one came with all the basics. We have face wash, exfoliate scrub that gets rid of dead skin cells, AM and PM moisturizer, eye cream, and super serum. Every box comes with an instruction card that tells me when to use each product, how to use it, and in what order. It's all very easy to use and a great way to start using skincare products. Teach Hanley has more than 5,000 five-star reviews on their website from satisfied customers from all around the world. As a Teach Hanley member, you also get perks like at least 20% off the retail price, the ability to customize your box, and exclusive monthly deals. Plus, you can pause or cancel at any time. 
and shipping in the U.S. is free. And Tiege Hanley is offering Screen Crush viewers a hot deal. Click the first link in the description and you'll get 30% off your first box plus a free gift. So let's talk about what this Star-Lord movie could look like. Star-Lord is a goofy character, and I don't really mean in a bad way. He's funny, he's immature, but he's also a very likable guy that you can't help but root for. When I think of what a Star-Lord movie could be, I think of a Seth Rogen stoner comedy, something like Superbad or Pineapple Express. And when you take into consideration Star-Lord's social status on Earth, a stoner comedy fits perfectly. I mean, think about it. In space, Star-Lord is an accomplished captain and a spaceship pilot. He's a deep space gunslinger. He's even a bit of a player with the space babes. But back on Earth, he's got none of that. He's a 40-year-old elementary school dropout who lives with his grandpa and is obsessed with rock bands from his childhood. I can see it now. Peter Quill, the weird guy who's back in town living with his grandfather, says that he's been to space and likes to go by the name Star-Lord. He drives around in an old van that he named Mercury after the lead singer of Queen, just like he named his past space ships to Milano and the Benatar. Basically, he's Jack Black's character in School of Rock. All I can say is, let's rock! He drives around blaring 80s music on cassette tapes on his way to his new job at a corner store bagging groceries. And hey, no disrespect to grocery bagging jobs, I think it's a step down for being a guardian of the galaxy. Now I could see Peter going in for job interviews that he may very well be qualified for, but on paper, they would just be crazy to hire him. I could just hear him mentioning how he knows the Avengers and how he's fought aliens and helped save the galaxy a time or two. Well, yeah, why doesn't it just join the Avengers? Oh, buddy, you know, he might be wanting to break from the hero's life. And keep in mind that the Avengers he knows aren't exactly really around anymore. Tony's dead, Spider-Man's gone solo, Doctor Strange is off with Clea, and Thor's still in space. So this could all result in Quill becoming really defeated and alone. And then he could take up your stereotypical stoner character type of role. Chilling in his grandpa's basement, eating Cheetos, playing Jedi Survivor. Check out our breakdown on that, by the way. He'd actually be getting to live the normal childhood that he never got on Earth. The only problem is he's 50. I'm not 50! Sorry, 40. He's 40, and he has no ambitions. He feels like a failure. You get the gist. And then we could see him be met with a situation that calls for him to return to his hero ways, a situation that needs the legendary Star-Lord to return. Or like Kang showing up or something? Well, yeah, I mean, yeah, it's definitely gonna be a situation I think that we'll see Star-Lord get involved with, but more on that in just a bit. For Star-Lord's movie, though, we've got two ideas. The first is a lot of fun, and it draws from the comics and helps to set up the X-Men, and it involves a heist. A heist? No, 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 that the heist are Ant-Man's thing. All right, true, but they were kind of Star-Lord and the Guardians thing first. Remember, we first met him when he was stealing the orb from Morag. And while Star-Lord and the other Guardians have grown as characters and are now more straightforward heroes, Heroes instead of anti-heroes, there is still something a little more plucky about them than, say, the Avengers. Don't call us plucky. We don't know what it means. So I could see Star-Lord being recruited by a ragtag group of people on Earth looking to pull off some type of job that doesn't hurt anybody innocent, but is more in the vein of a Robin Hood type job, a job that would only negatively impact a bad guy, sort of like what Scott Lang did that got him sent to prison. They were overcharging the customers, right? And it added up to millions. He blows the whistle and he gets fired. He hacks into the security system and transfers millions back to the people that they stole it from. And that brings me to the mutant who's going to recruit him, Kitty Pride. Now, Kitty Pride was first introduced as a young teenager in 1980's Uncanny X-Men 129, and she has become a fan favorite amongst X-Men fans. In the legendary Star-Lord comics, we see Star-Lord and Kitty Pride become romantically involved. Now, with the MCU now being able to use mutants and having already had several mutant mentions in non-X-Men projects, I wouldn't be surprised if we see the phasing mutant herself make her MCU debut in a Star-Lord movie. But won't they write and debut mutants in an X-Men movie? Too late my man, we already have multiversal mutants. <laughs> and we also have a kind of confirmation that Wanda had mutant abilities when she was a child when she defused the Stark bomb. Did you stop that bomb? What? You used a probability hex. Namor is also a mutant. He even uses the word. The blank gave me wings on my ankles and ears that pointed to the clouds. I was a mutant. And there's also the guy with big claws and a bar fight headline that we saw in She-Hawk. And of course, there's this. Like a mutation. So mutants are already in this world, so why not Kitty Pride? Now, before becoming a member of the X-Men, I could imagine that Kitty Pride may have spent some time doing some Robin Hooding of her own. With the ability to walk through walls, she would make a perfect cat burglar. Plus, I mean, God, her name's Kitty, and her alias in the comics is Shadow Cat. She'd be the perfect character to pull Star-Lord out of his funk, and then back into the gray area of an anti-hero for profit shenanigans like he used to do before forming the Guardians. We could see him having fun for the first time in a long time and starting to find his place on Earth. And with Star-Lord finally accepting that his Gamora 
is gone, we could see him and Kitty begin to fall for each other, like in the comics. But it's important that we don't let all these years of character development and growth for Star-Lord go to waste. So after a brief revisiting of his old Ravager ways and falling in love with Kitty Pride, we could see him encounter a line that he isn't comfortable crossing, a line that begins to drive a wedge between he and Kitty's relationship. And this is the moment where we can see the tables begin to turn. Kitty was able to pull Star-Lord out of his funk, and now it's on Star-Lord to return the favor. He needs to show Kitty the path of the hero, encourage her to use her powers not only to hurt bad guys, but also to help people in need, just like the Guardians do, thus starting her path to joining the X-Men. So the X-Men in the MCU could be assembled almost like the Avengers, with students slowly being introduced in different movies before finally coming together. So that's idea number one. Straightforward heist movie mixed with stoner comedy takes place on Earth. Now let's talk about idea number two. Like I mentioned before, the legendary Star-Lord comic was a prelude to the 2015 Secret Wars. Now that is the Secret Wars storyline that's going to heavily inspire the movie Avengers Secret Wars. So that's yet another reason I think we'll definitely be seeing this film happen in Phase 6. And it may even be one of the projects coming out between Kang Dynasty and Secret Wars. So we know that Kang Dynasty will very likely feature Kang coming to conquer the Earth. And I imagine that we'll see Star-Lord join the Avengers in their defense of Earth upon Kang's arrival. There's even a rumor that Sam Wilson will begin to reform the Avengers after the events of his movie, New World Order. He can work as a kind of Nick Fury character, rallying all these different people who fought Thanos who are still on Earth. And remember, Star-Lord was there, although uh, Sam wouldn't get a very good recommendation from Rhodey. So he's an idiot. And I assume that he'll be the only Guardian on the team or former Guardian that will be seen in Kang Dynasty. What? But, but what about Rocket and Groot? I mean, they got that new Guardians team. And what about Drax and Nebula? I mean, they're not coming back? Oh, uh, well, buddy, they didn't break up the team for no reason. Nebula's Karen Gillian, Gamora Zoe Saldana, and Dave Bautista's Drax the Destroyer have made it pretty clear that they don't plan to return to the MCU, at least not anytime soon. And while none of the characters were killed off, that wasn't necessarily so they could come back. It was so they could all have the happy ending that they deserved. And yes, we do have a new Guardians team, but I'm highly doubting that we'll see Guardians 4 until after Secret Wars and the Multiverse Saga. But I do think we'll see a big cosmic movie crossover based on the kick-ass comics Annihilation. But with that being said, it's been heavily implied that the Avengers Secret Wars will have damn near every Marvel character ever make an appearance in the film. So I think it's possible that we see at least a brief cameo of Drax and Nebula on Nowhere, Gamora and the Ravagers, and this new team of Guardians make at least a cameo appearance in Secret Wars. But at the same time, I kind of fear them having too many characters in Secret Wars, and this perfect ending for Nebula, Gamora, and Drax could be a great time to say bye to these characters indefinitely, at least until the universe is reset and they recast everybody Flash style. Oh wait, what do you mean by that? Sorry, let me back up. I do think that it's likely that Kang will win in Kang Dynasty, like Thanos won in Infinity War, and then the Secret Wars movie will likely take place in a new universe where Kang has created a battle world. Now in the comics, battle world was a patchwork of different realities ruled by God Emperor Doom. So change Doom to Kang, and you could have a planet that's filled with variants from all these different universes. So any film that takes place between Kang Dynasty and Secret Wars would either take place in the past, like Captain Marvel when it debuted before Endgame, or the movie could take place on Battleworld, so we could see Peter roaming the wasteland, encountering Old Man Logan, Topher Grace Venom, I mean, you name it. But. I think it's much more likely that we'll get a straightforward Star-Lord movie that explores the cosmic side of the MCU, which really we've barely seen. So the second idea that I had starts off as a heist movie slash stoner comedy, very Earth-based. Peter's kind of hanging out, telling his grandpa about his wild times in space, but then a cosmic threat arrives. Ooh, what cosmic threat? Is it Galactus or time is Galactus? It's the Celestials. But that already happened in the Eternals. Yeah, but stay with me. So the Eternals was... It's one of those movies that are kind of like the Star Wars prequels that we'll look back on and appreciate for what it was. The movie wasn't terrible, but it was too much. Too many characters, too many weird plot lines, too many villains, tonally dissonant. I mean, look, you've read the reviews. Marvel was clearly hoping the Eternals would be a hit, so they set up a sequel with two post-credit scenes. Half of the team was taken away by the Celestials, so then they could judge whether or not Earth should live or die. And the other half of the team joined up with Star Fox and Pip the Troll to go find them. Your friends are in big trouble, and we know where to find them. Now I should note that this was all added like in reshoots. Chloe Zhao revealed that the original ending would have just been the Eternals waking up on a ship with their minds wiped and Harry Styles is suddenly with them. And this is why the CGI on Pip the Troll looks so quantumania. So it turned out the Eternals was not like the Oscar bait blockbuster that the studio was hoping for. So like a direct sequel seems unlikely. It would have been announced already. But what if instead we get to see these characters in a Star-Lord movie? I mean, a lot of you keep mentioning that there's a giant alien sticking out of the Earth's crust and nobody 
has said a word about it. So what if all those events of the Eternals didn't happen until a little later in the timeline, until after Guardians 3? So like Peter's eating cereal and then he sees this on the news, he recognizes that a celestial emergence almost happened on Earth, so he goes to investigate. He's lived in space his whole life he knows what a celestial emergence is. After all, Peter is half celestial. Sure, the light inside of him is gone after Ego's death, so he has no special powers, but he is still one of their kin. And remember, Peter also used to live inside the skull of a celestial. He's the closest thing Earth has to an expert. So when Tiamat shows up in the sky to take away Circe and the others, Peter would know this is bad news. This is the third host arriving to judge a planet on whether or not it should live or die. So Peter would go off into space to find out what's up, and then he would run across Star Fox and the other Eternal and then they would all venture to the Celestial Forge. And this is where Icarus could also return. After all, he is a robot, and like Cylons, there are many copies. And Thanos could also appear, and we could get some kind of clarification on this, like whether or not he was a robot who was just trying to stop the emergences of the Eternals by using the snap. Having Peter face off against a robot Thanos would give him a chance to redeem losing his temper the first time around. Wait a minute, robot Thanos? What are you talking about? Okay. This gets weird. In the comics, the Eternals are not space robots. They're highly evolved, perfect human beings, basically. Thanos and Star Fox were both Eternals, but they were Eternals who grew up on Saturn's moon, Titan. The MCU changed Titan to a planet and revealed that Star Fox was both an Eternal and Thanos' brother. So, if the Eternals are all robots in the movie, then... Robot Thanos, got it. All that for a drop of blood. All of this would also help Peter to finally reconcile with the fact that he is part God. The Celestials are in the midst of judging Earth because it failed to produce a celestial baby. And behold, the planet did produce a celestial baby without them even knowing about it. The Celestials might look at Star-Lord and decide this kooky little planet Earth might be worthy after all because it already produced an offspring for their race, a mutant offspring. And don't forget for a second that I forgot about Star-Lord's half-sister Mantis, who is also half-celestial. Mantis is one other guardian who I do think we could see pop up at the end of Kang Dynasty and play a major role in Secret Wars. I mean, now she's in possession of three Avalis. These are creatures that can travel the multiverse. There's no way the multiverse ends without us seeing Mantis right in on an Avalis Boba Fett Rancor style. Like a bantha. And like I said, she's also half celestial and was the MVP of Guardians 3, but I think we can save all that for another video. But I want to hear from you guys down in the comments below or at me on Twitter. And if it's your first time here, please subscribe, smash that bell for alerts. For Screen Crush, I'm Ryan Airy.